Capital Forum's interview series. My name is Joe Tipograph, and with me here today is Josh Sobin from Gibson Dun & Crutcher. Uh, as background, Josh was formerly the chief of litigation one section at DOJ's antitrust division. And before that, he served as an attorney advisor to Deborah Majoris when she was chairman of the FTC. Thanks for joining us today, Josh. Thank you. Very happy to be here. All right, let's dive right in. Um, in the first segment, I want to talk a little bit about what we've seen recently with respect to market definition, competitive effects, and the interaction that they've had. Um, we've seen some changes to the merger guidelines in 2010, and we've seen trends in the, the, the types of complaints and press releases that the agencies are releasing when they bring uh, these merger reviews to a close. Uh, what have you been seeing? Well, the first thing is, while it's clearly been a substantial trend in development in agency practice to focus more on competitive effects analysis and less on structural analysis and market shares. Nine out of ten investigations or potential investigations still begin with the question, what are the market shares? I guarantee you that the staff that gets that HSR filing, when they start to talk about it with their group and with their managers, uh, both at DOJ and the FTC, does a rough cut at what those shares are, and then thinks based on those shares, is that a reasonable basis to open an investigation? And it's certainly the case that many second requests are still issued heavily based on structural analysis. In part, because of, A, it's still meaningful, and B, at that point, the staff doesn't necessarily have enough information to do a robust competitive effects analysis. That said, there's as I said, there's been an undeniable trend towards greater focus on competitive effects, and that's really for three reasons. Uh, the first is that the structural framework, which was used for decades both by the courts and the agencies, as economic tools became more sophisticated and experience grew over time, people began to doubt the accuracy of those structural presumptions, particularly in moderately concentrated markets. Three to twos and two to ones, people generally still thought that was a meaningful metric. But as the number of competitors in the market increased and there was greater um, certainty or uncertainty about entry barriers or the lack thereof, and just econometric tools improved, there became less confidence in simply doing long division as a way to make enforcement decisions. Two, what also happened is the focus on competitive effects reflects real world practical difficulties with defining markets in the economy as it is today. Particularly in differentiated product markets, and those exist not just in the technology sector, but in the consumer product sector, in many industrial sectors. The ability to define a market the way the courts came to expect, meaning sharply defined um, distinctions between functionality and use, and also, often underemphasized but important, a clean rhetorical way of describing the market that became harder and harder to do. So even though the agencies thought as a technical matter <clears throat> they could still define a market, when you had it faced with the challenge of presenting that in court, um, they ran into significant obstacles, cases like SunGuard, Oracle, even Whole Foods. All of that became difficult. So those difficulties, not just for a matter of sort of economic accuracy, but litigation realities, push the agencies to emphasize competitive effects, at least alongside structural work. Okay. And those three cases you mentioned, SunGuard, Oracle, Whole Foods, do you think that any of them may have had a different result had the shift from market definition to competitive effects story had progressed a little bit further at the time, or if they were brought today, perhaps? Whether the litigation outcome would have been different? Correct. Um, it's hard to say, but there's no doubt if you look at it, it may just be based on differences in the judicial philosophies of the judges who were reviewing the, deciding the cases. But there's no doubt the way the language in the H&R Block case reads is quite different than the way the decisions read in Oracle and SunGuard. And that's not necessarily just a reflection of, it could be a reflection of different judicial views. But I also think an underemphasized aspect of all this is both the agencies and the, cor the courts as they, grant, as they gain more experience and more practice doing this inevitably become more sophisticated and more comfortable with the analysis. So I think it was unreasonable or perhaps overly optimistic to expect that you could simply flip the switch from structural work to competitive effects and overnight produce litigation victories. 
But over time, I think the courts are becoming more accustomed to that argument. And I expect you'll see cases where the courts are quite comfortable explaining both the distinctions in the analysis and also the significant overlap in the analysis. One of the reasons that market definition in differentiated products cases looks strange at times is the substantive work, both in terms of the facts and the economics, is almost exactly the same. The market definition work and the competitive effects analysis is almost identical. So for example, even if you were to go back to the Staples decision and read how Judge Hogan described his thinking and his factual analysis as an economic analysis in defining the market, when you read the competitive effects section, the work is almost identical in the description. And that reality is becoming recognized, and therefore I think the courts will understand it better going forward, as will the agencies. Now, a term I've heard used is price discrimination um, ec econometrics. Is that, is that sort of along the lines of what you're talking about here when we talk about differentiated product markets? No, not necessarily. Um, price discrimination exists in some differentiated product markets. And all that means, that's just a fancy word for saying that some customers need the product more than other customers. And firms perfectly legally and perf perfectly lawfully recognize that and charge higher prices to those customers than they do to other customers. Where price discrimination is relevant and potentially challenging for merger analysis is that if you have a deal where only 10% of the customers are likely to be harmed, that's a harder story to tell in court than if 90% of the customers are likely to be harmed. And it's harder for two reasons. One, it can often be difficult to show with the necessary precision exactly who those customers are, and equally important that the merging parties are capable of recognizing and identifying those customers and charging them higher prices. And the second reason is that while it's not in the statute and, in, and not in the law, there is an implicit substantiality requirement to Section 7, meaning that while no one's put a percentage on it, a material fraction of the market has to be harmed for, I think, both the agencies to decide it's worth an enforcement action and for the court to decide it's worth blocking a deal. So just to put a rough number on it, if only two out of 500 customers were likely to be harmed as a result of a deal, even if you could show absolutely positively that that anti-competitive effect would occur, that type of price discrimination case probably wouldn't be brought because the effect would not be great enough. And what number could you roughly throw out to suggest that it might be substantial? It, it's really hard to say. The numbers are somewhat lower, I think, than people think. That if you were to look at the Oracle case, the, which was basically a price discrimination case, although, although the government did not plead it that way, far less than 50% of the customers were the affected class that the government was likely to be concerned about. But it's an area of the law where no one has specifically addressed it, and um, we'll have to see sort of what happens. Okay. And now, as, as the law appears to shift with experience, um, it still comes up against brown shoe, which, which very rigorously <clears throat> requires a market to be defined using um, cross-elasticity or interchangeab interchangeability of use. Um, how does that need, does that need to budge in order to, or, or, or can this new philosophy operate within a uh, brown shoe um, progeny? Uh, I think the latter, that while the issue is often framed as can the government bring a case without defining a market and does the case law actually require defining a market, which I think it clearly does. The question of whether you go either direction is really a false choice. And the reason is that in essentially all matters, if you've proved an anti-competitive effect, you have proved a product market at least under the terms of the merger guidelines. So if the merger of A and B allows the merged firm to raise price by 5%, with some technical caveats, that is a that is a viable and accurate product market under the merger guidelines. So the challenge isn't, it, so the, to confront the challenge, one does not need to discard the market definition requirement. What one has to get at is to, in a persuasive way, show the courts and come up with a robust way of doing so that this is in fact a product market, 
even though it is narrower than what courts tend to expect and what's been written about in the literature for decades. Merger law, Clayton Act Section 7, talks about lessening competition. But the, the standard is consumer welfare. Just tell me, what is consumer welfare? Well, consumer welfare is a, is a competitive effect that results when prices go up to consumers or quality goes down. The Clayton Act doesn't address it, as you say. The Clayton Act says a reduction in competition. And over the decades, there have been differing views of what that means. There's always been the consumer welfare focus. But if you look back at the opinions of the Supreme Court in the merger cases in the 1960s, they talk about you know, competition being the starting point. But there's also some famous language about Congress wanting to protect small locally owned producers meaning to protect against an increase in concentration in various markets. That latter concern, regardless of how one approaches the issue, is all but gone, if not entirely gone, from antitrust. And the primary focus, you say, is on consumer welfare. Now, there is this still ongoing debate as to whether one should think about consumer welfare or total welfare when doing the analysis. I think in most cases, it is largely an academic debate that as a practical matter in most mergers that the agencies investigate and decide to challenge, it's because they can show that prices are likely to go up, innovation or certain levels of service are likely to go down, or output is likely to go down. And while you could conceivably have different outcomes depending on whether you're using a consumer welfare standard or a total welfare standard, uh, in most instances you don't. And while it's often not really discussed, as a practical matter, the ability to tell the difference with the tools that are available to antitrust practitioners and economists are often quite limited. Okay. Um, well, what do, you, do, you, do you believe that the benefits that a company um, receives by consolidation and, and uh, achieving synergies or efficiencies should be incorporated into merger analysis? No question. Um, and they are both under a consumer welfare standard and a total welfare standard. So what companies typically and appropriately argue when presenting um, their antitrust analysis to the staff in a merger case is, look, the costs will go down. And you know, under standard economic theory, that should result in a reduction in prices to consumers. And while it's often pushed aside in the sense that people think the staff doesn't, don't really take that seriously and the antitrust agencies don't take that seriously, that's really not true. They, in fact, take it quite seriously. They do their best, often with a fairly high degree of precision, to make an informed decision as to whether the synergies are legitimate or not. And cases are closed all the time based on assessments like that. Now, that never comes out in court, usually, because in most cases they challenge, they've determined that they think the efficiencies case or the synergies case is quite weak and the downstream consumer harm case is quite strong. Therefore, people tend to draw the wrong conclusions from these cases where they don't see in-depth analysis of efficiencies. It's usually because the agencies think they have a pretty strong argument that the efficiencies are somewhat weak. Okay, but it seems that between the total welfare and the consumer welfare, there is some distinction in that the consumer welfare suggests that at least some of these efficiencies are being passed on to the consumer. Right. You could, if you're using a total welfare standard, whether the efficiencies or synergies are passed on to the consumer or not is irrelevant. That if the, if the synergies were to um, go to the benefit of the stockholders and the company under a total welfare standard, that would be a, not an anti-competitive deal if on balance those synergies were greater than the harm to consumers. And you could conceivably have a merger enforcement decision decided based on that balancing. My view is that as a practical matter, that doesn't happen for two reasons. There's an overwhelming focus both on the part of the agencies and on the part of the parties to show that the prices will not go up to consumers or levels of service will not go down. And while, as I said, the agencies do their best and sometimes do a good job analyzing those efficiencies, it is often too difficult for the agencies to do, and it's often too difficult for the parties to do. And given the enormous sort of premium on proving one way or the other whether consumers will be harmed, most of the resources in these investigations on both sides are devoted to that question.
Okay, but the, the consumer welfare looks looks downstream. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, if the company is able to use its size to reduce its costs, often this is referred to as economies of scale. Right. But at the same time, it could be the companies asserting its buyer power on the upstream um, suppliers. How can we tell the difference between the two? Right. Um, it's challenging, and part of the reason, part of the part of that challenge, or the substantiality of that challenge is why you see relatively few cases or investigations focused on upstream effects of mergers. What you're referring to is whether a merger is going to produce monopsony power or something close to it. The agencies do look at that, particularly in cases involving labor markets and agricultural commodities, and there have been complaints filed uh, asserting that theory. They're relatively rare, and they've never resulted in a matter going to trial and in most of those cases, my view is the agency knew they were never going to have to litigate it. So it was relatively risk-free to insert the monopsony count because they thought it was correct, but B, they never really thought they were going to have to prove it. The, the other reason it doesn't happen very much is that it's also relatively unusual, although it can happen, for a merger pr to produce upstream effects but no downstream effects. And given that it's such a simpler story, both rhetorically and often as a matter of economics to show the consumer price effect. If faced with the choice of devoting resources to both sides of the market or devoting the bulk of your resources to proving the consumer harm, in many cases, either explicitly or implicitly, the agencies decide we're going to go with allocating most of our resources to the downstream analysis. It's hard enough to do that, and I think many staffs conclude that if I spread my resources on both sides of the market, the probability of my get, being able to make an informed judgment on both um, is much lower than if I devote most of my resources to analyzing whether there will be a consumer price effect. And so what is the aggregate effect of, of, of consistently sh sh choosing to focus on the downstream effect? What is it for, for a, an extended period of time across multiple industries, what is the aggregate effect on upstream of uh, up the supply chain? I think it's very sector specific that it's for technical reasons. There's actually a relatively finite number of markets in which the probability of a monopsony effect is high. Um, the supply curve has to go up, not down, in order for monopsony power to be exercised. And in more markets than one would think, the supply curve goes down due to economies of scale being a viable part of that industry. So the primary markets, again, where people have identified the potential for, not, for monopsony power to be exercised as a result of a deal are the healthcare markets, where the agency, where the Justice Department does look to see whether health insurance mergers will enable the combined firm to reduce price to physicians. And again, they have looked at that quite seriously, but have not pushed it to the point where they needed to litigate. And I think no one has come up with a convincing answer to date that that choice of focusing on the downstream market has really resulted in different enforcement outcomes. That if you were to ask practitioners which health insurance mergers did the Justice Department miss in challenging as a result of being focused primarily on consumers, the list might go to as many fingers as you have on one hand, but that's about it. Talk about consumer welfare, total welfare, the idea of uh, efficiencies generated by the business as being looked favorably in a merger analysis. This is a, a, often a, attributed to the Chicago School, um, and that's common language used. Um, how much of an effect uh, has Chicago School had on where antitrust is today, and has there been any counter effects? I think the Chicago School has had a profound effect on antitrust analysis, but not in the way people often characterize it. Um, the cliche formulation to that question is, well, the Chicago School has significantly reduced the amount of antitrust enforcement out there, and there is, in fact, a substantial camp that thinks that result is wrong. Th that I don't think is true. The Chicago School did really two things. One, it questioned from a horizontal perspective whether there was enough evidence that mergers in relatively unconcentrated markets were reasonably likely to raise price. And over time, I think there's 
if not universal consensus, overwhelming consensus that that view is correct. You no longer see 10 to 9 mergers challenged and litigated successfully as you used to do decades ago. And so in that, in that sense, they clearly nudged the analysis in that direction, but we're at the point where no one really disputes that. Where the Chicago School also moved the work in a way that's perhaps a little bit more controversial is on the vertical axis. The Chicago School was skeptical that you could have vertical arrangements which increased market power and produced harm either from a consumer standpoint or a total welfare standpoint. And there I do think there's a, a large amount of consensus that that is correct, but less than there is on the horizontal axis. Some of the schools which followed the Chicago School um, called into question essentially this dogmatic rule that vertical arrangements could never produce an effect and came up with different theories and more sophisticated models to analyze the question. So, so Josh, you've worked both at the FTC and the DOJ, um, and, and both of these cover different industries. What's the, what's the effect of having these two agencies, and, and how does it impact merger outcomes based on uh, what industry a particular merger occurs in? Right. The, the conventional wisdom and the stock response you'll get is if one were to start from scratch, that no one would design a system where you had two antitrust agencies with largely overlapping jurisdiction. I actually, um, having worked at both agencies, think there are significant benefits to the existence of the two agencies, both from a cultural standpoint and a structural standpoint, that you know, any study or any sort of student or scholar of organizations will tell you that organizations, if not, well, they don't necessarily get stuck, do become very accustomed to certain ways of doing it, things, and it can be hard to break that pattern. I think as a result of the two agencies, the FTC and the DOJ, having different structures and sort of different management and different leadership, you inevitably get new ways of thinking about things and that both agencies in a constructive way have given the other ideas that have improved the product uh, of both the FTC and the DOJ. So while most, many people would say, well, look, really should shut, we really should shut one down, uh, I think there's a possibility that doing so would slow advancement and growth of antitrust enforcement and antitrust policy. Okay. Um, and so in the, at the FTC, what we have is a commission. Um, and the commission is divided by, at most, only three commissioners can come from the same political party. Um, when we see three to two decisions where the, the parties really divide along party lines, what are the differences in antitrust thought that drive those, those split outcomes? Well, I think those decisions are, while notable, extremely rare. And that when one looks at the big picture, the entire universe of mergers that come before the agencies, the degree of consensus um, both within the commission and really in sort of the broader pol body politic is quite big, uh, is quite great. Former uh, Commissioner Leary used to say, look, merger analysis in particular is played between the 40 yard lines of the football field. And I think that's right. That if you were to look back on prior administrations, while there's this cliche that one party is less aggressive than the other, it's a very small number of decisions where people would say, well, look, I would have done it differently. Now, within the commission, um, you can have circumstances where there is a split. And I think those splits, although they're rare, I think those splits are usually driven or the cause of one of two factors. First, if the theory is not a traditional reduction in horizontal competition, would say is a theory that's been raised in the standard essential patent matters, where the focus is not on the elimination of two competing products, but the focus is switching one asset from a party with one, an asset from a party with one business model to a party with a different business model. That is a relatively novel, relatively novel way to apply Section 7, and therefore it doesn't surprise me that you get a split because that's relatively new and the law and the economics are less settled. The other area where you might get a split is if there are different assessments of the probability in entry, but it is truly a handful of cases at most where that split has occurred. And I do think that parties can really get themselves distracted uh, 
in terms of putting together their strategy if they worry a lot about whether someone is an R or a D when they're, when they're doing their planning. That that can send you off in lots of directions and you can easily find yourself not having focused on what really matters, which are the key facts which describe the performance of the market. And therefore, in most circumstances, if I were representing someone, I would not focus on that at all. Okay, but a lot of attention is given to that, especially when uh, you see nominations coming through Congress. There, there is some hesitancy to push through uh, nominees of the opposite party. Um, why is there this tension if, if, if party politics doesn't come into antitrust? Well, I think you use the key phrase, party politics. While party politics, I think, is relatively non-influential in enforcement decisions within the agencies, it's obviously a very important part of our sort of broader political society. And therefore, what you have is a merger of just two different cultures and institutions, or a conflict of two different cultures and institutions when reviewing those nominees. And look, there are a few cases where the identity of the party clearly did matter. That, for example, the Justice Department would have kept the Section 2 report that was issued in 2008 had there not been a switch in party in the White House. And so that, that's, that's an instance where I feel quite confident that um, the switch in party did matter. But in terms of mergers, which make up probably north of 70% of agency resources, I think it is relatively unusual. And I have seen instances where companies were quite confident that because of the party of a particular assistant attorney general, that no enforcement action would be taken. And they turned out to be completely wrong. Okay. Well, what we have right now at the Federal Trade Commission is a, a, a two to two split <clears throat> along party lines. And in this particular instance, the two Republican commissioners, um, their rhetoric tends to overlap in certain areas. Right now, they're, they're, they're using the expressions evidence based approach to analyzing deals. Where is this common theme coming from? And, and, and what, are, what do we expect the impact to have on merger outcomes? I think that in most instances, the emphasis on an evidence-based approach is exactly what everybody is doing. That to go back to where we started a while ago, it even if the agency pleads a structural case in a merger complaint, it's exceedingly unlikely that's, that's all they will have. And that almost all merger challenges, be them resolved, be it if they're resolved in court through litigation or resolved by consent decree, the agency almost always has a lot of other evidence and evidence-based approach to support the challenge. You could, I suppose, have a potential split if you had an overwhelmingly strong structural case, but underlying market performance facts which suggest that the deal was not likely to produce a problem. But I expect those cases to be relatively rare if they ever happen at all. And that while it's completely understandable, given the stakes, that people latch on to potential splits in either the style of rhetoric or the substance of rhetoric. If you look at the outcomes over time, I expect there to be um, relatively few divisions. With the caveat that if the commission decides to adopt more novel theories, then you really could have different outcomes. But as long as you're sticking with the bread and butter in terms of analyzing whether the deal is likely to reduce competition by combining two close substitutes, then I think you're about to see, a, you will see a bunch of four to zero votes. Well, so where we see four to zero uh, votes right now, very frequently at the Federal Trade Commission is, is hospital mergers. <clears throat> and and this, is a re this came on the heels of a study that was done about hospital mergers. Is that the type of evidence that is required for um, evidence-based approach commissioners to find harm? Right. Now that, I think, is a terrific example of the degree of consensus that exists in merger enforcement, that the um, retrospective into the hospital markets, which was launched by former Chairman Muris, that came on the heels of a string of really um, emphatic losses by both the FTC and the DOJ in challenging hospital mergers. And the conventional wisdom there would be, well, look, one party might decide, look, we've taken our lumps in court, we're just gonna stop and move on. But what you in fact saw at the FTC was a bipartisan allocation of resources in a fairly controversial sector 
to apply the antitrust laws to go back and look and see what actually happened, determine that, at least from their perspective, the courts had been wrong, and then robustly go forward on a you know, unanimous basis to challenge transactions where one could anticipate a fair amount of local and judicial opposition were the case not presented in a very coherent and crisp way. But wouldn't that in and of itself, is, is that what we need now in order to challenge a merger, a, a retrospective of deals in the past that have been approved or and, and how that's harmed comp competition? I, I don't think so. I think that there's a tendency, and we all have it, to think that antitrust can do more than it can. While it's a very powerf powerful, important policy, it, it's actually quite limited in many ways in its capabilities. And as a result of those limitations, as well as just normal resource constraints, the focus is going to be on deals where you can show a pretty clear price effect. And those can be done without devoting a lot of resources to retrospectives. The other thing about retrospectives is they sound like a great idea in concept, but they are often extremely hard to do and enormously resource intensive. Chairman Muris thought it was worth it, and that made, decision made sense given the significance of the hospital sector as a percentage of our economy. But I think in most industries, one would conclude that the cost-benefit analysis is not worth it. Okay. And um, give me a second. All right, thank you. What, what role does Congress play in shaping antitrust policy and guiding antitrust merger analysis? It's pretty indirect. Um, as anyone knows who's been practicing, the antitrust laws have remained uh, stable and unchanged for decades. So they are not regulating the industry in a hands-on way in which they're doing, um, in which they do quite reasonably with many other sectors. Um, that said, the um, I think it's inevitable and appropriate that broad conceptual issues and directional trends are raised by Congress, and you know that uh, is taken into account by the agencies, just as they take into account the views of um, many, ma many sort of in the business community and many other governmental agencies, and factor it into their analysis. So, for example, the Commission regularly briefs uh, members of Congress at times on various enforcement programs. And of course, there's standard oversight of the Justice Department through the, through the Judiciary Committee as well. But what I do want to emphasize, because I think people often get the wrong, have the wrong take on it, is I am not aware of any instance in which congressional views about a transaction affected the outcome. Well, it's many, I think, think that happens. And of course, when there are hearings on a transaction, it's a natural question to ask. But I've worked for uh, members of both parties for many years at both agencies, and I'm aware of no instance in which a congressional positions affected the enforcement decision at all. Okay. Now, you, you mentioned earlier that antitrust is limited, <clears throat> and these antitrust agencies are the only agencies that, that really have the power to um, forestall consolidation. Um, but consolidation harms consumers or citizens in ways beyond what antitrust contemplates. Um, is there a need for, for Congress, the elected representatives of people, to step in and, and see if there's a way to broaden the scope, to make sure that the agencies that have the ability to preserve competition are have the full power to do so? Well, it depends what you mean by competition. If the focus of your inquiry is on consumer welfare or total welfare, then the agencies have all the tools they need to do that. If you wish to broaden the potential issues um, that one could look at in a transaction, say diversity of views or effect on the labor markets, not in a monopsonist sense, but in simply a welfare transfer sense, then the agencies don't, and they don't because the statute doesn't permit it as it is interpreted today. And I think most, if you never want to say all, but I think most would say those are largely political decisions which are much better left to A, either Congress or to more secular regular regulators like the FCC than the antitrust division and the, the FTC, which really have no experience in making those sort of welfare allocation decisions.
So, so Josh, you've uh, you've read the Capital Forum, is that correct? I have read it. I'd love to hear what you think about it. Yes, uh, yes, I've read the Capital Forum, and you, while you're clearly sort of a newcomer on the market, that there's many other media outlets that have been doing this for years. You've been noticed, I believe, based on the depth and level of detail that you've been bringing to your reporting on various transactions, and the fact that the way you write about it closely tracks the types of analysis, both factual and economic, that the antitrust agencies try to do internally. So in that sense, I think you have occupied a different space or staked out different ground than a number of the other publications that are out there. Well, that is the exact ground we try to stake out, so thank you. That is a, a, a very wonderful compliment to hear from such an esteemed professional as yourself. And that is the time we have. Thank you, Josh Sobin, for joining us today. And uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. Fantastic. Thank you very much.